How did Oswald escape the school book depository? Anybody know the answer to that? Walk the out the front door. Now there's information here I didn't give you <laughs> that I'm going to add to next year's notes. What happened is a motorcycle police officer by the name of Marion Baker, as soon as the shots were fired, put his bike down and ran towards the depository and he confronted Roy Truly at the, at the, uh, inside the depository and he went looking and he actually saw Oswald on the second floor and, and he asked him, he, as he saw him, he asked Truly, does this man work here? And he said, yes, so they let him go. So you'll kind of see the story of that. Was he like sweating? Yeah. Within seconds of the shooting of the president, Dallas motorcycle policeman Marion Baker, who claims to have heard shots coming from an upper floor of the Texas School Book Depository, ran into the building, pistol drawn. He immediately encountered building superintendent Roy Truly, who led him to the back stairwell. On the second floor, Officer Baker spotted a man, whom he would later identify as Lee Harvey Oswald, walking away from him. Agent Howlett walked the route believed to have been used by Oswald. Officer Baker testified that he saw something through the glass in the door on the second floor. This was the reason he confronted Oswald. But Oswald was immediately identified as an employee, and Officer Baker allowed him to continue. At that point, evidence suggests that Oswald simply walked down the front stairs to the first floor and out the front door. We did tell you that. So what's the answer to the question? How do you get out of the deposit door? Out the front door. Walked right out the front door. What was he doing on the second floor? Well, he had down come down, seats. and he was actually in the lunchroom. And so people don't know whether he came down and ducked in there to kind of find his way out or what. But lucky for him, he was seen, but all the police officer wasn't really, he, he just was looking for, you know, in his mind, someone that maybe didn't work there. Though somebody's out of place. So he said, does this man work here? When Truly said, yes, he does, they let him go. Do you think that cop feels pretty bad? Well, I think... Okay, where did Oswald go after fleeing the scene of the assassination? This will be a little bit lengthier, but I think you know the route, but we'll just go from there. According to the reconstruction of time and events by the President's Commission, Oswald left the building about three minutes after the assassination. He walked east on Elm Street to the corner of Elm and Murphy Street. Seven blocks east of the depository on Elm Street, Oswald boarded a bus. About four minutes later, he got off and hailed a cab to the Dallas suburb of Oak Cliff. He asked the cab driver to drop him off at Neely and Beckley, which was three blocks beyond his rented room. He then backtracked to his rooming house, picked up a jacket and his revolver, and left again. Moments later, he would use that revolver to commit murder. Who else did Oswald shoot on November 22nd, 1963? Shouldn't have too much trouble with that one. Less than a mile away from Oswald's rooming house, at the intersection of 10th and Patton Streets in Oak Cliff, Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett spotted a man fitting the general description of the suspect in President Kennedy's slaying. The man was Lee Harvey Oswald. Tippett pulled alongside Oswald, and they exchanged a few words through a vent window. Tippett then exited his vehicle and approached the suspect. Oswald quickly drew his revolver and fired three shots into Tippett's chest, and a fourth into his temple. The murder was witnessed by nearly a dozen people. I thought to myself, you know, from the beginning, Somebody shoots at the president, somebody shoots a cop three or four miles away. Sort of idea that it's connected, you know. This guy, Hugh Ainsworth, is an interesting kid guy. We'll talk about him later. He actually is, was a reporter for the Dallas Morning News and just happened to be at all... He was, at the, he was down in D. Lee Plaza during the assassination. He was over where Tippett was shot, and he also was where Oswald was shot as well. He just kind of drew those assignments. This is a guy... This is a guy that believes strongly in non-conspiracy and has a great quote to the FBI, which we'll talk about later. Whoops. How did Oswald enter the theater without being seen? Swapped in. 
Because Julia Postle was on the sidewalk doing what? Smoking. I don't know. I listening to the radio and seeing what was going, what the sirens were. Doing. After killing Officer Tippett, Oswald cut across a grass lot, shed his jacket, and began walking west on Jefferson toward the Texas Theater. It is here where he attempted to elude what had become a citywide manhunt. Questions persist about how he was able to get into the theater without a ticket. Box office attendant Julia Postal testified that a man fitting Oswald's description approached the theater as police sirens in the area were blaring. When she looked back a moment later, he was gone. Concession attendant William Butch Burroughs testified that he was stocking candy at the time and saw no one enter the theater. What film was playing in the Texas theater when Oswald was arrested? War as hell. And that's an interesting thing because they're going to tell you about the uh, main actor in that, the little co coincidence he has with President Kennedy. So what film was playing in the Texas theater? Actually, it was a double feature. The one that got the most nor notoriety was War as Hell, which was about the Korean War. The Texas theater was running a double feature on November 22, 1963. The film playing on screen when Oswald was apprehended and arrested was War is Hell, a Korean war drama written, produced, and directed by Bert Topper. The film is lost today, though fragments of it have surfaced in recent years. Coincidentally, the film's lead actor, Baines Barron, was born on the same day as President Kennedy, May 29th, 1917. Oh. How did police know Oswald was in the theater? How'd they know that? The guy in the shoe and, store. Yeah, shoe store guy saw him. Yeah, but how'd they, how'd they know for sure? He told me. Who? The guy pointed me. Who called? Julia? Yep. At approximately 1.35 p.m., in. Johnny Brewer, manager of a shoe store on Jefferson Boulevard, observed a suspicious looking man sneak into the Texas theater. When Brewer approached box office attendant Julia Postal and asked her if the man had purchased a ticket, she said no. Together with the concession attendant, Brewer searched the auditorium for the man, but it was too dark to see anything. By the time they emerged, Postal had already heard a radio report describing the suspect police were looking for. She called police, and within moments they had surrounded the theater. If you just put in there that Julia Postal called the police, that would be great. What was Oswald originally charged with? Very good. When police entered the Texas theater, they were looking for a cop killer, not an assassin. They stopped a couple of people, and then they finally got to Oswald, who was about 15 feet in front of me to the left. As he stood up, he said, well, it's all over now. And they jumped in pretty fast. After a struggle with police in which Oswald pulled his pistol and attempted to fire, Oswald was wrestled to the ground and handcuffed. He was charged not with killing President Kennedy, but for the murder of Officer J.D. Tippin. It would be more than five hours and three interrogations later before Oswald is formally charged with assassinating the president. He never confessed to either murder while in custody. Coming up on... Are they good commercials? No, Viagra. <laughs> My wife is sitting there, you know, we watched this the first time, she goes, you got to cut the commercials. Oh, that's all it is, is stuff like that. And I just didn't want to, you know, push it through all men. So, <laughs> Mrs. Durr said, no commercials. Now, here's a prelude. We haven't talked about this, but we're going to talk about it in detail. And this, to me, is the key to the Kennedy assassination. I, these people like Ruth Payne and Wesley Buell, Frazier, and uh, Jim Lavelle, they don't even want to talk to student groups if they don't know this piece of the puzzle. And what happened here is Oswald was looking to do something melodramatic. And so he actually planned a first assassination before he ever assassinated the president. 
And that's what we're coming up to next, and we'll explain in detail. But this is a key ingredient to the assassination, because people believe if he would have been successful in this assassination, he would have never been in a position to assassinate the president. Seven months before President Kennedy's assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald targeted retired Major General Edwin Walker. You don't have to write this down because I'm going to give Dallas. you it all tomorrow. According to Oswald's wife, Marina, Oswald identified Walker as a fascist and plotted to assassinate him. On April 10, 1963, Oswald fired at Walker while he was sitting at a desk in his home from a distance of less than 100 feet. The bullet hit the frame of the window and missed the general. Oswald had previously left a note for his wife detailing 11 instructions for her to follow in the event he was arrested for the act. You will get a copy of those 11 instructions. Oh, wait, can you tell us what they are now? No. There we go. Um, this is a real brief thing. Don't really write it down. You'll, this, is a, this, to me, is the key. He does do this. He plots for this guy, shoots at him in April. They had those old-fashioned windows that had the wood separators in them, and the bullet actually hit one of those wood separators and missed Walker's head by not much. He left a note for his wife on what to do if he got caught, which he absolutely would have gotten caught, don't you think? By the way the Dallas police caught him in this other deal, is there, there's no doubt in my mind they would have caught him. If they would have caught him, what would they have done with him? Got him in jail. Yeah, and he would not even have been in the ball game to shoot the president. So that's pretty crucial. That? That's what I think conspiracy theorists don't like to hear, is that you know there was a conspiracy to kill uh, Kennedy. If he would have killed Walker, there would have been never a chance to kill Kennedy. That's why I think this is a key piece of uh, uh, information that throws conspiracy theorists out the door. Did you use a Carvano to shoot? Same rifle. Right? Mm -hmm. From the moment Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested, was television thing? reporters in Dallas. Let's go back to that thing. From the moment. What was the first televised murder? <laughs> in U.S. history. What was the first, what was the first, there it is. What was the first televised murder in U.S. history? Which one was it? Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald getting shot. Yeah. From the moment Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested, television reporters in Dallas swarmed the municipal building where he was being held. So on the morning of November 24th, 1963, when Oswald was set to be transferred to the county jail, cameras were rolling. There was already a melee as they were waiting for Oswald. I was about four or five rows back, sort of being bumped around by other people and, and thinking, that, well, you know, this will go easy. We'll know, and he'll come out. And he did. He came out. The lights went on, flashed like that. And, and suddenly, uh, I heard one pop. Fritz, there is the prisoner. You have anything to say in the fence? Oswald has a shot. The shooter's name was Jack Ruby. It was the first televised murder in American history. Was Jack Ruby and why did he want to kill Oswald? See if these are any of the same ones we said. Jack Ruby was the owner of the Carousel Club, a Dallas burlesque. He was well known in the local business community and by law enforcement. Ruby had a reputation for being impulsive and desiring to be the center of attention. And that was his personality. You very seldom was he just, you know, low key. That could have turned a lot of people off, you know, because he the way he was. Ruby was an admirer of JFK. He held special esteem for Mrs. Kennedy and made no secret of the anger and shame the assassination had brought to his town. He was devastated, as was everybody that lived in Dallas. A lot of people wanted to kill Oswald. But Jack had the opportunity and the chance, and so he ended up doing it. Tammy True, she was one of his headliner strippers. Oh, it wasn't Little Wynn. Yeah. I was wondering if it was Little Wynn. No, no, no. Tammy True was probably the most 
I, I don't know whether little Lynn's dead. I don't know. But that, Tammy True was the one. That, I do have, I got to show you something. I do have a picture of myself and one of Jack Ruby's strippers. Oh, yeah. Not looking too good right now. We went out and visited, went out to a house. I'll, I'll show you that. It was interesting. Tammy True was the headliner at Jack Ruby's downtown burlesque club, The Carousel. I worked closely with Jack Ruby for two and a half years. Other than his immediate family, oh. True knew Jack Ruby better than anyone. And more than any other living person has special oh. insight into Ruby's motives oh. for murdering Hello. Oswald. I know why Jack did what he did. Jack thought he was going to be a hero. And to be fair, he was. But it only lasted one day. He really did. And I'll talk to you about this too. I did a telephone interview with Earl Ruby, his brother in 2000, and he said the same thing. He said he really thought, Jack Ruby really thought that he would be made as a hero and people would come into a strip club and he would just become a famous fellow. He, and you know, there were a lot of people who supported what he did. The problem is he screwed up a lot of things when he did it. What event led to Ruby's fatal encounter with Oswald? What? Yeah, On the evening of November 23rd, 1963, Jack Ruby received a phone call from Lynn Bennett, a performer at the Carousel Club, asking for $25 to pay rent. This is incorrect. The next morning, Ruby drove downtown to the Western Union and wired the money to Bennett in Fort Worth. Less than a block name? away at the municipal... What? Should we put her actual name the way we learned it? Yes. I don't know what, you know, it bothers me when they get these things wrong. But she, and they didn't call the night before, they called the morning of. $25 to pay rent. The next morning, Ruby drove downtown to the Western Union and wired the money to Bennett in Fort Worth. Less than a block away at the municipal building, Lee well, Harvey well, we Oswald was about to be transferred well, to the county jail. Ruby walked toward the parking garage entrance and continued down the ramp, where a flock of reporters had gathered. Because he was a friend to Dallas law enforcement, and often a fixture in the background of police headquarters, Ruby met with little resistance as he approached the crowd and suddenly found himself face to face with Lee Harvey Oswald. Just clear a couple of things up. They got the wrong stripper unless she changed her name. But it could be Lynn Bennett, Lynn Carlin, I don't know. Anyway, whatever. But the point being is that it wasn't unusual for him to be down there. He'd been to police headquarters lots of times. A lot of police officers had been in his club. He, I mean, he wasn't, nobody thought he was going to go down there and shoot Oswald. He wasn't the only non-police officer in that basement that day. He was just the one that decided he was going to come down and take care of business. Do you think there was another person down there with a gun? That got him before, like, Ruby got him. Would, would there be? It? Yeah. You never know. Yeah. People weren't happy about this. So, okay, what did Jack Ruby leave in his car when he shot Oswald? When Jack Ruby exited his car for the last time on the morning of November 24th, 1963, he left behind a valuable personal possession that casts doubt on his committing a premeditated act of murder. That prized possession was his beloved dog, a dachshund named Sheba. He had two little dogs, and he took them everywhere with him. Especially Sheba, she was his favorite. This fact was later used unsuccessfully by Ruby's defense attorneys in an attempt to prove temporary insanity. It's kind of interesting. This, is, this gave conspiracy theorists a wide line of running here. Joe Campisi was the alleged leader of the Dallas Mafia. Joe Campisi. I think it's C-A-M-P-E-Z-I, but don't quote me. Never really taught this, but I thought I'd show it to you. Joe Campisi. And best friend to Lee Harvey Oswald's assassin, Jack Ruby. He was Ruby's first visitor in jail, giving rise to decades of speculation that Ruby's actions were somehow tied to the mob. Joe Campisi's son, Corky, remembers his father explaining Ruby's rationale for killing Oswald. I said, why did he do it, Dad? He said, do me, did it because of oh, what Jacqueline Kennedy There you go. Let's go back and get that. Ruby's ration. 
now for killing Oswald. Listen, what's you doing? Corky Camp, Camp Peasy, Camp ISI, had it wrong, sorry. I was actually just one wrong. But it's interesting, and this is a mob guy who's got nothing to lose, telling what his dad told him about why Ruby did this. We did it because of what Jacqueline Kennedy was going through. He fell for her, and seeing that little kid. This is what I was telling you before. Who was the only person to have witnessed JFK's assassination, Oswald's arrest, and Oswald's murder? Ainsworth. Howard, right? What? Ainsworth? A Ainsworth, oh. yep. Wait, don't go yet. Okay. That's kind of, and, and he'll tell you about it, but it's kind of cool. Hugh Ainsworth, and he's got a real great quote I'm going to save for you a little bit later when he talked to the FBI. When he found out the FBI had all this information on Oswald, and went and talked to him about it, and they gave him their, his, when they gave him the answer to his question, he made it quite a comment. 32-year-old Dallas Morning News reporter Hugh Ainsworth was the only person to witness JFK's assassination, Oswald's arrest, and Oswald's murder at the hands of Jack Ruby. I think that the fact that I was at all these scenes has given me certain insights people may not have. That's how you spell a name. <laughs> Caught him in a bad moment there. There's a town right next to the place I used to live in Nebraska called Beansworth. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Okay, that is pretty amazing that he was able to be it, though. But I must tell you that it was pure dumb luck in most cases. That weekend, I could have been anywhere else. It was pure dumb luck. What happened to the gun that killed Lee Harvey Oswald? Anybody have a guess? Jim Lee 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 What? You have it. Oh, I wish I did. Oh. What? What's that? Police locked up evidence. Actually, they they it was, but they still belong yeah. to somebody. Belong to him. <laughs> okay, hey, let's not. Uh, Terry True. No, it's pretty pretty good guesses, but this is pretty pretty interesting. Love her cold Cobra revolver that Jack Ruby bought for $62.50 and used to kill Lee Harvey Oswald was the subject of a 25-year court battle between Ruby's brother Earl and Ruby's former lawyer, Jules Mayer. So Jules Mayer had it, and, jo and Earl Ruby wanted it. Okay, we'll see who ends up getting it after 25 years and what happens to it. Because the question is what happens to it, right? Ownership of the gun was finally awarded to Earl Ruby, and in 1991, he auctioned it off to a private collector for $220,000, much of which was used to pay legal fees. Very good point. Um, what, what Earl Ruby did is he, he felt that his brother, and he wasn't in doubt that his brother was uh, guilty, but they gave his brother the death penalty, and he didn't think that was right, so they appealed, and he was granted an appeal, and Jack Ruby died before the appeal came about. But anyway, Earl Ruby fought like crazy to get the, to get possession of that pistol, and then he sold it for that price, and he used the money to try to get his brother exonerated from the death penalty. How did he die? He died. 